As an island nation with 11,000 miles of coastline, the UK has a strong affinity with fish as a source of food and with working the sea. Whether trawling the North Sea for haddock, fishing inshore for lobster, or among the giant waves of the Northern Atlantic looking for cod, fishing is a hard, dangerous job that requires grit, guts, determination and amazing levels of stamina. In fact, few professions carry the same sort of risks. A recent study found that a trawlerman was 50 times more likely to die at work than in any other profession. While the sea is a cruel mistress that carries huge risks, UK fishermen face other threats almost as great. Since joining the European Union in 1973, the story of the UK fishing industry has gone from one of success to one of political betrayal, of lost jobs and of decimated communities. Whilst sustainable fish stocks surround the UK, the last half century has seen a massive decline in an industry that was once the heartbeat of many UK cities. Through a number of concerted media campaigns, it is easy to think of the fishing industry as unsustainable, where the seas are trawled relentlessly for all manner of species, totally unchecked. This could not be further from the truth. The EU in Brussels currently controls all British fishing and fishermen are told where they can fish, what they can catch and what they can bring to land. The problem is many quotas are set on misguided information. And through the EU's common fisheries policy, shared access rules the UK now only has 13% of the sustainable fishing quota in its own seas. This leaves the proud, hard-working fishing communities frustrated, desperate and on the edge of collapse. Member of the European Parliament for Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire, Mike Hookham, whose father worked on the docks, remembers the days when the fishing industry was vibrant and at the heart of the community. I mean, across the river there is where I was born and brought up. This, to me, was my playground. As a kid, this is where I came, this is where I messed about on the ships, on the docks, uh, and watching the trades that was going on. The fishermen came across here to the Chandlers and bought all of their equipment uh, before they set sail from these buildings, and there was many, many buildings across there. And this was probably, I always remember it, as one of the last places I'd stand to see the trawlers going out into the river and out to sea. Three week fishing trip, they'd be out there, they'd come back uh, for three days and would be known when they came back with the, when they'd settle for the money as uh, a three day millionaire. They would then get off the trawlers onto Hazel Road. Again, Hazel Road was just across the way there. Very, very busy area. All of the people there in some way was uh, was working for the, the fishing industry. There'd be wet fish shops, there'd be fish shops, there would be tailors, clothing, everything was out there. It was a village within a city. All those jobs, those trades, those people are now gone. There is no more fishing industry in this area. The knock-on effect now is that the housing that's there is, is declined, the area's declined, People now are lot, no longer living in this area, they're moving out to other estates on the city centre, on the city periphery. And uh, it's a poor state of affairs, you know, what, what we're left with today. For generations, men have made a living from the sea or in associated industries. At its peak, an estimated 650,000 UK jobs were directly dependent upon the industry and the British fleet was the largest and most technologically advanced in the world with over 12,000 vessels of all types. Whole communities grew up around the UK's fishing ports, especially in Padstow, Brixham, Grimsby, Hull, Fleetwood and Peterhead. Pubs, clubs and shops thrived as fishermen and their families spent their hard-earned wages ashore. People were very proud of the living they earned and what they did for this country. So what happened to decimate one of the UK's most successful industries? The first big blow to the UK fishing fleet came with the Cod Wars, which nearly took the UK into an armed conflict after the Icelandic government extended the exclusive economic zone around their island, limiting British fishing in its waters. The general demise of Hull's fishing industry 
I could see it coming off. Them were the first signs. I could understand the Icelandics. It was their living. It was just the methods that they used. I feel sure they could have got together the two governments and uh, sorted it out on an official level. Uh, I think that uh, the British government in general could have uh, done a lot more for us, stuck up for us a bit more, or we're back to the same thing again, negotiation. Iceland eventually achieved its overall aims to the detriment of the already declined British fisheries, severely affecting the economies of northern fishing ports in the United Kingdom such as Grimsby, Hull and Fleetwood. However, the beginning of the end for the UK fishing industry sounded when in 1973 Tory Prime Minister Edward Heath took Britain into the European Union, then known as the EEC. Hours before Britain was admitted, the original six EEC members drafted the notorious addition to the aqueous communitaire. It obliged new members to surrender control of their waters to Europe and to agree to equal access to a common resource, as far as fishing was concerned. In his desperation to join the EEC, Heath gave up our sovereign right to an exclusive 200-mile fishing zone and accepted the principle of equal access, essentially handing Britain's proud fishing industry to Brussels on a plate. It led to this dreadful business of quarters where trawlers were catching fish and having to dump it. Since the Cod Wars and joining the EU, the number of people employed in the fishing industry has declined dramatically. Today, only an estimated 12,000 people are now dependent upon the industry, from a peak of 630,000. Much of the decline can be put down to the EU fish quota system that is imposed on the UK through the unfair EU common fisheries policy. In 2014, under the EU's common fisheries policy, British fishermen could only catch 13% of the sustainable quota. This is despite 70% of the sea currently under European Union control belonging to the United Kingdom under international law. It also manages all UK fish market and trade policy, international policy and the funding of the CFP itself. Uh, quota is uh, something that's given from uh, Brussels and it's shared, I don't say share equally, you're given a portion of quota from uh, Brussels and it's shared out by the government in the UK. So you would be given a certain amount of fish to catch. Once you caught that fish you could catch no more and then you would have to discard that species. Both the EU and UK governments rigorously enforce UK quotas as this local fisherman found out when the UK suddenly stopped all skate fishing in Biddeford. What's been done, we've done a lot ourselves to conserve the stocks, but all around the British Isles, what's been done, I mean, it is proven now, stocks, stocks are increasing, and yet stocks are increasing, but quotas are going down and down. Tell us about this brand new empty factory you've got here. Uh, this was put together about five years ago, uh, cost of 3.8 million. Uh, nice facilities, beautiful facilities. How was it funded? Uh, AC grants and such like uh, does make you wonder I mean we'll go in now you'll see the processing area completely empty uh, this has gone on from the 12th of October due to the rate closure Again, you know which was mismanagement by the MMO it just makes you wonder where it's going to end sometimes as you can see, this is the processing area, completely empty, fridge is empty. Uh, really, you should have, it should be 20 staff, uh, filleting, skinning, packing. Uh, fish would go all over the UK, exported as well. It was about seven, 10 days after the closure of it, uh, the MMO turned up here at these premises. I th honestly thought they turned up to have a chat and a cup of coffee about the closure and have a discuss things, but it wasn't. There was a raid, they raided the premises, looked everywhere, looking for raid. And uh, I just found it unbelievable, their, their attitude towards things. But surely they must have thought that the, the horrendous fines you get if you get caught Nobody's stupid enough to do that. Those days are over. I mean, uh, and anybody now gets caught, the fines are colossal, 300, 400,000 pounds. Your house is gone. You're treated, uh, you're treated like a criminal with the Proceeds of Crime Act. I mean, what type of industry goes through that? It's 
just gets unbelievable. Bit, over, bit OTT. I mean, at the end of the day, some of the hardest working people in this country are fishermen. I mean, there's nobody puts more hours in than them. They're hard working people and they just get no respect. It's, it's heartbreaking how, how a fisherman is treated. The decline in the fishing industry was equally mirrored on shore in the communities that built up around the industry. Once where son followed father to sea, for many young men and women, the only thing on the horizon today is the dole. It has a knock on effect because they're not fetching the same kind of money in, so they're not earning as much, and then they're not, they're not able to provide for the families the same. And of course, it makes a decline in the town because there's not as many people. I mean, we know just by coming down ourselves, there's nowhere near as many people coming shopping down the town because people just said the money isn't there anymore. And I do think a lot of it is to do with the fishing industry. You know, I mean, all, all the local communities um, rely on the, on the fishing industry. As you can see yourself, you've got markets, you've got cafes, you've got everything all around. All you've got to look around now is in this port, and see, I can see it, how many youngsters is here today taking on the fishery. You can't see the early none at all. No. And years ago, all the youngsters were coming down here, leaving school, they would go up the net loft, mending the nets, get that, and then come on a boat and doing their jobs. It's not happening today, because there's no, they know there's no future in it. It's, but there could be. There could, most definitely it could be. If they destroy the fishing industry down here, I genuinely believe it's going to have a much, much bigger knock-on effect than what they truly believe. I've been fishing since I was 15, left school at 15. Uh, family's been fishing for... Oh, well, my dad's gone back to the 1600s. We were fishing then, the family was. My grandfather's was fishing when my uncle was. say right there's no quotas for a year and then, then the end of it tally it all up and see what's actually in the sea 
not the way they're doing it. They haven't got a clue. There's nobody represents our fishing industry that knows anything about it. 100% of fishermen would rather bring in everything they've caught and let me sold for charity or something. You know, you could have a separate auction. That's what they've caught is dead. Put it to one side, whatever money's raised there. I don't know, go to a children's home or something. Every fisherman would bring their fish in, ice it, use their own boxes, if they knew it was going for something like that. Brussels, in Brussels at Christmas time, just in December, they, um, they tell the British government what they can have. You know, which I just, you know, we're self-sufficient. Every boat, our fishing grounds are the best in the world. They are the best fishing grounds in the world. Everybody's trying to get it. The French are here, the Spanish are here, the Belgians are here, the Dutch are here. They're all trying to get it. Get out, leave us alone. It's called the English Channel. It's not called the French Channel, is it? You know? As you can see, uh, North Cornwall coast there. We are heading down to Padstow very shortly there, off that coast there, approximately 15 vessels, all about every one of them Belgian or French. Not one English boat there fishing, all foreigners. I mean that can't be right, it's... it's when, all, when all the English boats are tied up. People have got to start to listen and realise what's going on. It's, it, it's just ridiculous. Totally, totally ridiculous. Well, that's pretty, pretty plain to see that is. You can't get any blacker, uh, blacker than that. I mean, that's updated every two minutes, so didn't like you can stick them on the screen. That's it, they're black and white. This boat has got to gross a thousand pounds a day. It, it's got to, you know, it seems a lot of money, but then, you take the 300 pound a day fuel, you've got, I've got four crew, they've all got mortgages, they've all got families, they've all got kids, and they've all got to be paid. That's the last of the lemon. One of the pieces of Jacoba, if you have it then. If the fishing industry stays as it is, you know, the fittest will survive. Um, we obviously, some of the vessels that we have here in Brixham couldn't continue on the quotas that they've got now. They just need an equal access to, you know, the common resource. I would hope if we manage to get our fishing grounds with a sort of 12 mile limit, I would hope that we, you know, our economy would, would boom. While many politicians seem to think the betrayal of our fishermen is a price worth paying for membership of the European Union, we in the EFDD parliamentary grouping, and UKIP in particular, do not. Amongst the doom and gloom, hope can be found. Looking at countries outside the European Union, such as Norway and Iceland, we can see how a vibrant and successful fishing industry can be built, while still keeping fish stocks sustainable. The key to the success of the Icelandic fishing industry is that we put a, a quota system in 1984. But what we did is that all the quotas are, we can transfer the quotas between each ship and uh, um, it's all transparent. This is a web page from the government agency. And here you can see every boat in Iceland. Uh, you can choose, here's a boat, and uh, uh, you want to know how much quota the boat has. The boat fished 2,400 tons of Greenland halibut, even though it only had 1,800 tons of, of um, quota in the beginning of the year, because we can change with other vessel owners and other vessels. So that is the key, that the boat has many species, but we're only fishing mostly one or two species. You can see everything on the internet. There's no secrets. You can even see the landing of the boats. 
Through good long-term management of the exclusive economic zone, the Icelandic fishing industry has gone from strength to strength. Small fishermen can catch 750 kilograms of cod a day, four months a year, creating an industry that allows enterprise and investment. Iceland is now home to many factory ships that catch, process, box and freeze fish all at sea, just like this one. Well, it's a typical stern trawler and it's uh, 66 meters long, 14 beam. No draft is around six meters. Well, we are doing a whole freezing, you know, the process is, they're working eight hours and eight hours rest. We can take like 650 tons of mackerel, then we are full. Well, the process is like uh, we empty the cottage to the to, to certain holes and, and take it from the holes and grate it, uh, put it in, in, in the, the, the freezing plants, and then to packages, then to the hold, then when, when it's discharged, it's taken to freezing containers and exported to, to, to the buyers. The harbor is the heart of Grindavik and has been for a very, very long time. And, and, um, and this coffee house is, of course, a room where we are were uh, before working with steel wires. We, we, we were making steel wires in here for the boats. The fishing is a very, very important for Icelandic economy. I, I would say that, that um, it has changed a lot. I think that now you are working in the fishing with fewer boats, with the same amount of fish, but uh, the same quota, but, but um, uh, this is, has been and, and is, I think, still today, the biggest uh, industry to make money for Iceland. The, the fishing industry and the scientists, we are working together to, to where shall we do it? And then the government has to make the decision where we close. But the key was a good cooperation between those three parties. This is the best system in the world. And this is based on the property right. If you don't have a property right, then there is no, uh, how can I say, there is no responsibility of the industry, of the people in the industry. Because we take care of the, of, the, of the fishing ground, not the politicians. Because you change politicians every four years. And usually politicians, they have no responsibility at all, whatever country you go to. I think EU is doing a big mistake because uh, they think they can control everything from Russia, but it is impossible. You must have a simple rules and you must make the people in each area responsible for their own fishing. The reality is, while the UK will never have the fishing industry we once had, with some political will and by leaving the European Union and the crazy common fisheries policy, we could once again have a fishing industry to be proud of. Here we go, sir. Thank you. I hope this film has shown you how much more there is to fish than what you see on this plate. I hope we have highlighted how the fishing industry once was and what a perilous state that it is in today. It has also shown you that with a little work and freedom from the restrictive European rules, how the fishing industry in the United Kingdom could be in the future. The EFDD Group and UKIP would like to give the fishing industry a chance to rebuild and to see fishing communities reinvigorated. We will never regain the fishing fleet we once had, but fishing still plays an important role in the economy and coastal communities. And I, for one, am committed to fighting to regain our fishing industry.